Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Anne. I'm back with part two of the Sisters Hospitals, the Old St. Vincent Hospital. The historic building is now a hotel and is considered one of the most haunted places in New Mexico. So let's go. The Old St. Vincent Hospital started out as home to Bishop Jean Baptiste Lamy. In 1865, Bishop Lamy sold his former residence to the Sisters of Charity of Cincinnati. Sister Mary Vincent was the first Sister Superior of the hospital. The hospital was named after St. Vincent de Paul of France. The Sisters of Charity were well known for helping the poor and homeless and nursing soldiers back to health. Therefore, the hospital was partly funded by U.S. Army soldiers. In 1884, Santa Fe's school board contracted with St. Vincent Hospital. The sisters would then care for and educate homeless girls. They would have no less than 19 girls in their care at any time, sometimes having three times as many. No matter the number, the sisters gave each girl every advantage they could. In fact, St. Vincent went into debt for a little while. They were only receiving funds 10 months out of the year, and not every child was receiving funding. The Reverend Father Thomas Hayes gave them a large sum of money that was enough for them to build the large brick addition to the building. St. Vincent could then house about 60 or 70 girls. In 1886, Joseph Burke was found clinging to life on the ground near Presbyterian Church. Burke only had a nickel on him when he was found. This was odd because Burke had been paid his monthly wages the day before and was said to have a large role on him. Upon investigation at the scene, Burke appeared to be badly bruised in the face and head. Officers thought he had been repeatedly struck with a revolver by his assailant. Burke's half-frozen body was then taken to the county jail for some reason and placed on a cot. Dr. Sloan was called, who had Burke's body transferred to St. Vincent Hospital, where they hoped to question him when he regained consciousness. But at about five that evening, Burke passed away. By 1887, St. Vincent was running out of room, so Sister Victoria directed her efforts to raising funds for other buildings. In 1890, the new orphanage was opened. The main building would then be devoted to the hospital. June 14, 1896, a fire broke out about 5 p.m. in the space between the ceiling and the roof of the hospital. When the fire was discovered, the alarm was sounded and attempts to put out the fire were made. Firemen and hundreds of people came to help fight the fire. But as the fire broke through the beautiful ceiling, the airflow made it burn much faster. They focused on fire control for the hospital annex, orphanage, and nearby buildings. They tried to remove what valuables they could, but part of the roof fell, causing the lower floors to ignite, and the lack of water pressure worked against them. The hospital building and the kitchen connecting burned to the ground. The sisters made cozy accommodations for the patients they had by putting them in the adobe annex of the burnt hospital, and they used the reception hall of the orphanage as a temporary dining room. They decorated the table with beautifully fragrant rare roses. What I find so amazing is the climbing pink rose stood strong in full bloom. Newspapers wrote of it being about 20 feet high where it once clung to the walls of the hospital. It didn't bend, burn, or break. The sisters said they wouldn't consider building elsewhere and already received many telegrams and letters offering help and funds to rebuild the hospital. The sisters even said the fire actually restored some of the patients that were suffering from consumption, saying the fire had a tonic effect on them. They seemed brighter and better after. What may have caused the fire is still a mystery. 
Could this be one of the first reported hauntings at St. Vincent? In 1891, Mrs. S.C. White of San Pedro died at St. Vincent Hospital. White suffered a stroke that caused paralysis. She suffered at St. Vincent Hospital for several weeks before she passed. In 1901, a gunfight broke out between two men over a card game in the Oxford Saloon. Three shots were fired. Harry Daly fell to the ground with a shot to the shoulder and one to the spine. Albino Arias grabbed Daly's revolver and ran down the street. He turned back and fell near the Bonton restaurant. Arias was taken to his house where he passed just as he got through the door. Daly was taken to St. Vincent where he passed the next morning. In 1902, Edward W. Wren also passed at St. Vincent Hospital, but what's interesting is that he was also stricken with paralysis. Wren had been at the hospital for 10 years before he passed. In 1905, John McHune suffered from tuberculosis while serving a life sentence in the Santa Fe Penitentiary. Prison authorities allowed him to be taken to St. Vincent Hospital. McCune wrote to the same authorities while in the hospital asking to be taken back to prison. He passed from his illness at St. Vincent. In 1907, Samuel W. Marshall, who was a locomotive engineer, had recently been admitted to St. Vincent Hospital. He sat at the edge of his bed on a Saturday night and was talking to friends while having a cigar. When death suddenly came upon him, Marshall, who was just 27, suffered from tuberculosis. Another death caused by paralysis at St. Vincent in 1911 was John H. Niebel. He was a very well-known lawyer in New Mexico at the time and was admitted to St. Vincent Hospital on June 2nd. About a month later, he passed at the hospital. It just seems a little suspicious that all these people are passing away from paralysis at the hospital. In 1914, a fire broke out at the St. Vincent Hospital. The fire started on the ground floor in one of the offices. Men had been working in that room earlier that day and tore up the floor and wiring. They said the wires were smoldering since the plumbers left the room, but I don't know. Two sisters passing through an apartment on the second floor smelled smoke. They went to see what was the matter and found the fire blazing. One poured a pitcher of water on the fire while the other sounded the alarm. The fire department quickly put the fire out and damages were estimated at about $600. In 1919, Hostin de Nevega of Shiprock was charged with stoning his wife. After she passed, he hit himself in the head with an axe and was taken to St. Vincent Hospital, where he actually recovered. Oh, and in 1931, while serving time at the state penitentiary, your girl Teresita Ferguson spent time at the St. Vincent Hospital as well. Teresita had been sick for a while, and Warden Slope thought she should be removed to St. Vincent Hospital, where she could get the best of care because she was, quote, a model prisoner. In 1949, St. Vincent Hospital was approved an expansion program for $250,000. On January 4th, 1953, it took them a year and a half, but they finished building the four-story addition building with 200 beds. The hospital came a long way from the old adobe building with mud floors and a leaky roof from which it started. In June of 1977, the hospital moved buildings. After the hospital moved, the Finance Committee for St. Vincent Hospital encouraged Marion Hall to be torn down in hopes to sell the building to the state hospital, who would use it as a psychiatric hospital. The chairman of the hospital board described the Finance Committee's action as almost a psychological thing and said it would be a monumental mistake to demolish such a historic building. Which makes me wonder if the activity in Marion Hall was the reason for the suggestion to get rid of that part of the hospital. 
Like they brushed it off so they could just make money on the old building as is. I mean, it's just business, right? A woman who worked for St. Vincent as a candy striper before it moved said the basement is really big and it has multiple rooms and hallways. She said the basement was dark and gloomy even during the day. When she worked there, she hated going to the basement and would try to avoid it. She said after getting off the elevator, she mostly turned to the right. That hall led to maintenance offices and was another route to Marion Hall. She said going left led to an exit and a storage for kitchen carts. To the left was also the kitchen incinerator, which was used before to burn amputated limbs. When she had to go left, she said she felt a presence and was extremely cold when getting closer to the incinerator. She also recalls having heard disembodied voices down there at night. Not that weird things didn't happen when you went right. Marion Hall also had some strange activity, as well as the surgery floor, which was located on the third floor. In 1983, a nurse making her rounds on the third floor at 2 a.m. felt somebody behind her. She turned and saw a shorter man standing there. She asked him who he was, and the man disappeared before her eyes. When it was time to do her rounds again an hour later, she stopped and looked through the door window before entering where she had seen the man earlier. To her surprise, she saw the man come around the corner. Then she saw a lady much taller wearing a veil and white gown run past her. The nurse looked down and saw that there were no feet under the white gown. Later, the building served as a nursing home. One of the nursing home staff was riding an elevator down to the third floor. The elevator didn't stop until the basement, though. Repeatedly pushing the elevator button that closed the doors, he pushed every button on the panel. He waited for a bit, but still nothing happened. He stepped out into the huge basement to see if there were stairs close by. As soon as he did, the doors quickly closed and the elevator went back up. He pushed the button for the elevator to come back down and face towards the elevator so he could run in. The feeling there was somebody behind him freaked him out, so he started looking for the stairs in a hurry. The feeling something was behind him was so strong that he looked back and actually saw a shadow following him. He started running through the dark basement, tripped over something and hit his head, knocking himself out. After this, the staff avoided the basement, but then it became sort of an initiation for the new staff. They would take the new staff members down to the basement in the elevator and leave. The new staff members would have to find the stairs and meet back up on the third floor. During one of these little initiations, a nurse's aide was taken down to the basement, but after some time still hadn't found her way to the third floor. The nurse's coordinator and another nurse had to go check on her. There was very little light down there, so the nurses called to the new aide. They ended up finding her huddled in one of the storage rooms. The aide told the nurse she heard weird noises, got scared, and got lost. While making their way to the elevator, the nurse noticed something on the wall that looked wet. She touched it and smelled her fingers. It smelled familiar, but she couldn't see. On the way back to the elevator, she recognized the smell of blood. When they were in the elevator, the nurse looked at her fingers covered in a dark liquid, which startled her. So she called out, close the doors. That's not the first or only report of the walls of the basement bleeding. It turned out she found the aid in the room where the old incinerator used to be. After that, they stopped their little initiation. The staff that originally started it even admitted that they wouldn't have gone into the basement for any amount of money. The building became a hotel in 2007. One of the former employees said the hotel was blessed by three priests before it opened. 
She said the activity isn't really that bad. But I'm guessing she doesn't work overnight. Because the hotel security guard reported strange things happening in the basement and corresponding room and said he would try to avoid those areas. He also claimed when he and another guard went through a door that led to Marion Hall, which is in the original part of the hospital, he said he became physically ill upon entering. He saw black starting to cloud his vision more and more as he went further in. He had the other guard aid him out of that part of the building before he passed out. When they went back through the doorway, he said he felt about 90% better. He also said the building radiates heat when standing near it, but it's cold to the touch. There's also been claims of the rooms 311, 313, and 315 being blocked off by authorities and not being able to be rented out anymore. This happened after this video clip was shown on the evening news. <laughs> That's not the vibes. Oh my god, Dad, can you like please go turn on those on? Like... You're recording that, right? Yeah. Here we go again. Time to be quiet. Oh my god. Be quiet. Time to go to bed. Now. Now, go to bed. Time to go to bed. Please. Allegedly, the same night this video was taken, the night audit had to go up to the roof multiple times. Guests were complaining of a woman on the roof yelling, bang harder. Now, it is a hotel, so it could have been coming from one of the rooms. And just sounded like it was coming from the roof. But hotel workers have called the video a hoax. I've also heard the Marion Hall is off limits. There are claims the building is still full of old medical equipment and files. A daughter of one of the former workers allegedly broke into the old building and was scared so badly she never talked about it to anybody. The girl's mother said unexplained things would happen every day. Chairs would move on their own. Lights would turn on and off, and they would hear strange noises. She also said her first day on the job, her superior reassured her not to worry when he would turn off the lights. She said that freaked her out, so she never asked who would be turning off the lights. Others have said the building is haunted because the nearby museum uses a room in the basement for storage of ancient Native American artifacts. Another former employee of the old hospital said she wouldn't be surprised if there were even human bones in boxes down there. What really happened down there is still a mystery. I don't think we'll ever know why there's so much ghostly activity. As you can see, the basement has a history of people seeing apparitions, hearing disembodied voices, loud banging, and even feeling something touch them. So what do you guys think? Do you think that you would want to stay at that hotel if you ever came to Santa Fe, New Mexico? <laughs> I'll tell you, I've never stayed there, but I have had friends that have stayed there and can say that there were definitely weird things that happened. We'll see you guys at the next one.